So good evening everyone. Today I would be discussing patent ductus arteriosus based on the 2020 guidelines published in Indian Pediatrics. So what exactly is patent ductus arteriosus? In fact, ductus arteriosus is a connection between the aorta and the pulmonary artery in the fetal life because that is how the blood that is coming from the uh, mother to the baby reaches through the ductus arteriosus to the systemic circulation. But as soon as the baby is born and the baby takes the breath and the oxygen enters the lung, the pulmonary pressures come down and the oxygen causes a functional closure of the ductus arteriosus, soon to be followed by an anatomical closure. But in some patients, the PDA may not close. The PDA may remain open and that is what is known as patent ductus arteriosus. And so this uh, connection between the iota and the pulmonary artery causes a left to right shunt throughout the systole and diastole because the iota is supplying the systemic circulation. So it is always under a higher blood pressure than the blood pressure inside the pulmonary artery. And because the shunt is happening from the iota to the pulmonary artery, it is always a cyanotic heart disease. Now, as you can see here, the blood flowing from the iota to the pulmonary artery. Now, what happens to the blood that reaches the pulmonary artery? From the pulmonary artery, the blood will go to the lungs, causing lung congestion. And this congestion in the lung is responsible for recurrent respiratory infections as well as tachypnea in case of CCF. And this increased blood would return back to the left side of the heart, that is to the left atrium through the pulmonary vein. And that is what is responsible for the dilatation of the left atrium, that is left atrial enlargement. And from the left atrium, the increased blood goes to the left side of the heart, that is the left ventricle, causing cardiac enlargement and LV epic. So that was the left atrial enlargement. And this is the cardiac cardiomegaly causing an LV epic. Look at the apex; it is dipping on towards the diaphragm. So now, as you can see here, when the increased blood is flowing from the left atrium to the left ventricle, this would cause a loud S1 and there would be a delayed diastolic murmur because of the increased blood flow from the left atrium to the left ventricle through the mitral valve. Remember that the intensity of the delayed diastolic murmur is, is proportional to the shunt. So the larger the shunt, more intense would be the delayed diastolic murmur. The increased blood that is reaching the LV is causing an LV enlargement. And when this increased amount of blood flows through the iota, through the uh, aortic valve into the iota, it causes an ejection systolic murmur. But this murmur is usually in the bedside. It is difficult to make out because it, uh, it is drowned in the continuous murmur. And this increased blood flow into the iota causes iotic root dilatation and also leads on to multiple ejection clicks and because uh, there is an increased blood flow happening through the iota so the A2 is often delayed leading sometimes to a paradoxical split. So now what are the clinical features? So you should remember that the PDA can be of different grades that is it can be small it can be moderate it can be large. So in case of a very small PDA it may be completely asymptomatic you may pick it up only by an echo or by a physical examination whereas a large PDA they will be symptomatic and usually they become symptomatic between six to ten weeks a preterm in preterms it may be manifested earlier. So why do they manifest at six to 10 weeks? They manifest at six to 10 weeks because this is the time the pulmonary pressures come down and the shunt increases. And the usual manifestation would be features of CCF like a suck, rest, suck cycle. That is the baby finds it difficult to continuously suck after some sucking for some time, it stops sucking. So it is akin to the exertional breathlessness that you see in an older child. There may be head sweating while the baby is sucking, failure to thrive, and recurrent respiratory infections. And coming to the physical examination. So what are you going to see in inspection and palpation? The first thing that you should see is a high volume pulse. And this high volume pulse is due to the wide pulse pressure as the blood runs off from the systemic circulation into, into the pulmonary circulation. So you should remember that 
PDA can cause a continuous murmur, which is the classical murmur, but it can also cause just a systolic murmur. And the left to right shunt presenting with CCF at six weeks, it becomes difficult to differentiate between a PDA and a VST. But in that case, just go and palpate the docilis pedis. If the docilis pedis is bounding and well palpable, you should know that you are dealing with a PDA in most cases. Then what happens in case when you look at the precordium, the precordium is hyperkinetic. It is hyperdynamic. You can see multiple pulsations there. And the larger the shunt, the more hyperkinetic the precordium appears. There would be cardiomegaly leading on to the apex to be shifted down and out. And uh, if there is a pulmonary arterial hypertension, you would find a thrill in the pulmonary area. In the uh, You will be getting a palpable P2 in the pulmonary area, a thrill may also be felt in the pulmonary area because of the flow across the PDA. Then in, P in patients with CCF, you will also have a hepatomegaly. So auscultation, what are you going to find? We have already mentioned that you will have a loud S1 due to the increased flow across the mitral valve. You can have a S2 maybe paradoxically split, but often S2 is difficult to make out because it gets drowned in the continuous murmur. P2 is loud if there is a pulmonary arterial hypertension. And if it is a large shunt, you would be able to hear the S3 also. Remember, small PDS won't have an S3. Then the murmur, the classical murmur is a continuous machinery crescendo, decrescendo murmur. As you can see the shape after the S1, the intensity is increasing. It is peaking at P2 and then the intensity is coming down. That is the exact reason why you are not able to make out the P S2 well in case of a PDA. And the ejection systolic murmur, as we already said, is usually drowned. It is usually should be heard in the aortic area. And there is also definitely a delayed diastolic murmur in the mitral area. The more intense it is, the more larger the shunt is. And you would be also hearing multiple clicks in the uh, murmur. Then coming to the investigation. So as you can see here, an X-ray would show you a cardiomegaly. And you can also have pulmonary plethora if there is a venous congestion in the um, lungs. And then you can see the LV type of apex, which we have already mentioned, and also left atrial enlargement. When it comes to the ECG, ECG is usually normal axis. If you remember, everything abnormal in a PDA happens in the left side of the uh, lung. All the merge, murmurs are also uh, originating in the left side of the heart. So in the left chest leaves, that is in V5 and V6, you would find a deep Q wave, a tall R wave and an upright T wave. All these are indicative of volume overload. And of course, the definitive diagnosis would be doing an echocardiography and really demonstrating that versus uh, the patent ductus arteriosus. How do you know if the PDA is uh, big or small, if you are, if the patient is having features of CCF, if the patient is having failure to thrive, if the patient uh, is uh, having recurrent respiratory infection, that means the child is having a significant PDA. On examination, bounding pulse due to the white pulse pressure, large heart size, that is um, cardiomegaly, presence of third heart sound, and delayed diastolic murmur signify a large shunt. And as I already said, PDA can be of different uh, sizes. Remember, the length of the PDA murmur does not tell you if it is a large PDA or a small PDA. Because in a large PDA, the murmur may be short because of pH. In a small uh, PDA, the murmur may be continuous or the murmur may be just systolic. So the length of PDA murmur does not tell you about the size of the uh, shunt. What are the complications? As we already said, congestive cardiac failure failure to thrive, recurrent respiratory infection, infective endocarditis, and pulmonary arterial hypertension finally leading on to reversal of shunt or Eisenmenger syndrome are the complications of PDA. It is because of the risk of infective endocarditis that you often tend to go for PDA closure. Now, how do you manage? Management has two parts. The first part is when a child is presenting to you with the CCF, how do you provide the supportive management? So here, as usual, you would be looking for the airway breathing and circulation and stabilizing it. Keep the baby in a propped up position. 
provide oxygen if the patient is hypoxic don't provide oxygen if the patient is not hypoxic because oxygen will cause pulmonary vasodilatation and increase the left to right shunt but provide adequate peep this would help to decrease the ccf or pulmonary congestion the peep can be provided non invasively by a bubble cpap or a non invasive ventilator and if the patient is too sick may require an invasive ventilation also preload reduction can be done using diuretics like flusamide and after load reduction may be done with an aca inhibitors now how do you manage in a preterm remember in preterms also there is a chance that the uh, pda may close so if the pda is not symptomatic in a preterm there is no need to close it but if the pda is symptomatic then pharmacological closure can be tried with using paracetamol ibuprofen or indomethacin and usually pharmacological uh, methods are tried only for the first 14 days again emphasizing if the patient is having features of ccf now what about older children your options would be if you have this abnormal connection of the pda can be closed using a non operative method that is percutaneous closure using either a coil or a device may be done and this is the preferred method but it's mainly preferred for babies more than 6 kg there are places where even children less than 6 kg are taken up for device intervention but uh, it is difficult to do and in such situations or in some anatomical conditions where a device closure is not possible then you could go for a surgical ligation so these two are the definitive treatment for pd i hope you understood what how pda is done and now coming to the time of closure if you have a large pda ccf with ph the uh, can be done an early closure that is between 3 to 6 months uncontrolled ccf may take even earlier than that but normally it is 3 to 6 months if it is a moderate pda with a mild ccf wait for 6 months to 1 year for the sorry, for the closure and if it is a small pda you can close at 12 to 18 months so as you can see here all clinically evident pdas are closed by 12 to 18 months and if the pda has been diagnosed only by echo no clinical features of pda no murmur of pda that's the only pda you are not going to close so that was a brief overview of pda thank you